Kara Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Karis Books and More, and we are in the house of Karis Books and More. Most of y'all probably already know that Karis Books is turning 40 this year. Wow. And I hope that as you're giving Karis a hand, you're also thinking about yourselves in that because Karis exists because you exist, because you are here, um, we are here. We are so thankful to be um, among the oldest feminist bookstores in North America, certainly the oldest in the South, the largest. And we think a lot about what it means to be a Southern institution, to be political Southerners, um, creating good spaces in solidarity and on common ground with lots of different kinds of people. And Sol has been one of our people from the very beginning. From the very beginning, absolutely. And when you take this book home, you'll see. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So um, we love to have new authors launch their books here, but we especially love to have homecomings. Um, it's something that really, um, for me, it's about thinking about what feminist community really is, and it's a place that you can come back to again and again and again, and you'll be welcomed, um, no matter where you are in your life cycle. Right. <laughs> no matter if you have just messed up royally, <laughs> or you're going through a hard time. You know, sometimes people we joke that people um, get into a relationship, like they're they're all up in Paris, and then they find a girlfriend or a husband, and then they're gone, <laughs> and then they come back like ten years later. <laughs> and sometimes they come back because they're having children, or um, because you know, things didn't work out so well. Um, or because they've gotten a new job, or because they want to learn how to cook, or they want to, you know, learn more about poetry, or they want to write their own book. Whatever the reason, we are thrilled to welcome you back. We have several former board members in the room tonight. Anybody who's ever served on the Care Circle board, or is currently serving on the Care Circle board, will you raise your hand? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So, it's truly a community effort. If you're not on our mailing list, we would love for you to be on our mailing list. We're doing a lot of really amazing things for our 40th birthday. Uh, one of those things is we recently got a grant to begin filming our events and putting them online. What that is going to mean for us is that we're going to get to take this magic that happens inside the walls of Paris, which is not really replicable. Because y'all are getting a special right. in-person thing. We don't really think that you can bottle it. But to the degree that one can bottle something of that, we will be more truly living our mission by sharing what happens in here with the outside world. With women with small children who can't leave their house to come out to an event at 7.30 at night, with older folks who can't drive at night, with people with disabilities who cannot leave their houses for one reason or another, it helps us to more truly live our mission to have these videos online. So I hope that you will um, allow the intrusion of the camera. It's not something we are yet used to, but we are excited about it, um, and, uh, and enjoy the idea that what we're doing in this room is going to make an audience for you. So, one last thing. Save the dates for November 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th. That is our 40th birthday party weekend. That is our National Feminist Homecoming weekend. We are calling all of you Call all your friends to tell all the people that you know who are progressive, interesting, right-minded folks, men, women, children, folks who I don't identify as any of those things, to come <laughs> to Atlanta that weekend and be with us to celebrate 40 years of feminist history. So there's going to be a party. There are going to be speakers. We're in the process of writing love letters to people all over the country and asking them to come home to Paris. So we want you to come home would like to know more about how you can support that, um, you can talk to me. And um, there, there are many, many flyers, many, many ways to support. Um, but the main thing that you can do is just be there and celebrate with us. Because as I said, there is no Karis without you. So it is so wonderful always um, to be at Karis. I'm very proud that I was here the first week Karis opened. Um, I got to read poetry here the first week. And I was very nervous because I had been kind of living a life where I wasn't doing poetry and all of that. Um, I had been working in politics, which is another world altogether. 
Um, and my friend Kay Hagen and I were on a program. We were going to read poems at Karis. And I will never forget it because we were so nervous. Both of us were poets, and we were young poets at that time, which tells you how long ago that was. <laughs> um, but it was such a wonderful moment because we were reading our own poetry in a feminist bookstore. And we were new feminists, and we were so excited to be here. And I have that feeling every time I come here. This is just a, an amazing place. I've been all over the country, and so many feminist bookstores have closed. They just didn't have the support to do it. So the fact that you're here means that Karis is still here. And it's not just still here hanging on. It's here vibrant. It's here growing. It's here doing the work. Um, that it does because this is a place that changed our lives. You know, you're trying to become a feminist in Atlanta, Georgia in, you know, 1970, whatever it was. And it's like it's very difficult to find the books even that you want to read to teach you what you're trying to do and to find other women who are not going to say, ooh, you are so crazy, <laughs> who are going to talk to you. And we found all that here so that it's, um, it's always wonderful um, for me to be here. Um, this is uh, actually the last event of, um, of a kind of formal book tour. I, I'm always going around talking and all that. But um, I've been from one end of the country literally to the other. I don't fly. So I went to California on my book tour. Me and my husband drove to California, drove to New York, drove to Philadelphia, drove to San Francisco, all of that. So that I've had a chance to really look at the country and meet a lot of people in the country. And don't let the Tea Party fool you. This country, is, we're doing good. We are really moving ahead. There's a lot of very progressive people in every sector of this country. And sometimes when you watch the news often, um, which is important that we watch the news often, um, you begin to think that this country has become John Boehner and his acolytes. And it's so not true. There are groups just like us all over this country who are, are claiming the country for what it is and what it can be. Um, so I, I'm very happy to be closing this three months that I've been on the road and around and about here back home um, at Karis. So thank you all so much um, for being here. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking quiet. See, I got all emotional, I had to. Okay, talk loud, talk loud, okay. Um, I wanna read a little bit um, from the book and then um, we can talk a little bit. I also am coming from, I work with a program, I'm in residence at the Alliance Theater as a playwright and I work with a, a group of 20 young people every summer in a project called the Collision Project. And it's wonderful and I've got several ex-collisioners here, I won't point them out, but I see them, I see them here. Um, it's a wonderful project and it's an exhausting project because we're trying to do everything and tell everything to these young people in three weeks. And today we took all of them, this is the end of our first week, we took them all to the new um, Center for Civil and Human Rights. And if you haven't been, please go because it's got, it's got everybody that you would want to see represented in that place is there. It's a beautiful thing and a beautiful place and it's wonderful for us to be here. So this is like the end of that week too, talking to young people going to the civil and human rights, crying about all the pictures and people that I know and all of that. So I will try to keep my voice up. I am a little emotional about being here, but y'all can handle it. So we're good. So I'm going to read a little bit and then we'll talk a little bit. Okay. Okay. I also have some former students here. I have some former teachers here. I mean, this is just like <laughs> wonderful. Thank you all, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna read a couple of sections so that you can kind of get a flavor for it. The question. I told my daughter over lunch at our favorite hamburger joint that upon my death, which as far as I knew was not imminent, mm -hmm. I wanted to leave the diaries and journals I've been keeping since I was 11 years old to my granddaughter, Chloe, who was three at the time. My daughter didn't even pause to consider the idea. Absolutely not, she said calmly, <laughs> reaching for the ketchup. She doesn't need to know all that. All what, I said, surprised by her reaction. All that, she said, raising her eyebrows as if I knew perfectly well what all that was, so she wasn't required to provide any specifics. You've never even read my journals, I said. I knew this to be true since she had politely declined my offer to provide her with unlimited access to them when I thought she might be curious somewhere around her 15th birthday. I didn't want her to have to sneak and read them the way I did when I discovered a volume of my own mother's diary carefully concealed in the back of her closet. That discovery made me understand for the first time that my mother had a rich interior life, not to mention a sex life that didn't include me at all. <laughs> Far from being hurt by this, it deepened my affection and respect for my mother, who had now been revealed to me as a mysterious, passionate, creative woman engaged in a valiant struggle to balance love and freedom. My daughter didn't see it that way. She saw the journals as uncensored, unedited slices of my life meant for my eyes only. 
Any attempt to include others in such an intimate experience after the fact and through no fault of their own struck my child as self-indulgent, insensitive, and unnecessary. Aren't you even curious, I said? Curious about what, my daughter said. About my life, I said, about what happened. Mom, she said, gently but firmly, I know what happened. I was there, remember? <laughs> After that, it seemed wiser to move on to more neutral topics, <laughs> but I couldn't get her reaction out of my mind. If part of any sane woman's life is figuring out how to spot the lies, remember the lessons, and engage passionately in the love affairs, aren't my journals among the most primary of primary sources? And even though my daughter is telling me they are probably nothing more than a toxic brew of rage, whining, scandalous behavior, and unreliable memories, I am not convinced. After all, she only has one half of the equation to consider. Yes, she was there, but my daughter was not privy to the relentless soul-searching, merciless self-observation and rigorous self-analysis that allowed me to survive my early womanhood and emerge with my health and sanity still relatively intact. Those crucial conversations only took place in the pages of my journals, where clarity came slowly over years, and the resulting behavioral changes occurred gradually enough that my daughter could not be expected to draw a straight line from one state to the other. She only saw my mad flight toward financial independence, sexual liberation, creative fulfillment, and free womanhood not necessarily in that order. <laughs> Looking back, I wonder if it's possible that the things I didn't tell her are as necessary as the things I did. Do us all a favor, she says, gently dropping me off at home later. Burn them up and be, <laughs> and be done with it. I am shocked by her suggestion. If I was gonna burn them, I could have done that every year as part of my New Year's Eve rituals. <laughs> Give thanks for what is just finished and what is about to begin. Make your resolutions, drink champagne with the beloved, burn your journals, no way. <laughs> there is a reason why I save them all these years, carting them from my baby girl bedroom to my college dorm, to a series of apartments and finally home. There is a reason they have survived, and even if I'm not exactly sure what that reason is, I probably ought to think about it a little longer before doing anything as irrevocable as burning. I decide there is only one way to figure out who's right. I'll read them all and then decide. I'm surprised to realize how many there are. Stacked in cardboard boxes, stashed in my great-grandmother's Alabama steamer trunk, spilling over the sides of an overflowing and badly tattered basket, demanding organization and attention. They have mutely rebuked me many times as another year passes, and I add a few new volumes to their number without going back to be sure that 1967 isn't crowding 1996, and that those pages I took out from December of 1982 were correctly replaced and not stuck in April of 1984 <laughs> by mistake. Clearly, the first challenge is narrowing my search for mystery and meaning to a manageable number of notebooks. I need an organizing principle, but based on what? Dates times, places, decades. The idea of a couple of decades appeals to me. 20 years is not enough time to be overwhelming, but it's more than enough to be a representative sample. As best as I can recall, the two decades between 1970 and 1990 were pretty action-packed as far as those lies, lessons, and love affairs I was talking about earlier. I know for a fact that I left college, moved to Atlanta, got married, finished college, got a job, had a baby, quit a job, <laughs> wrote a book, helped elect a mayor, quit another job, <laughs> got divorced, lived by my wits, became an artist, had a play produced, had my heart broken, mended it, found my honor, found my smile, realized I was a lot stronger than I thought I was, a lot wilder too, but all that came a lot farther up the road. <laughs> February 9, 1971, New York City. On the road with Karen Spellman for the Southern Education Program Recruitment Tour, we're recruiting black grad students to teach at black Southern colleges for two years after they finish grad school. We present it kind of like a Peace Corps thing, which is weird, but I think a lot of people see the South as a foreign country anyway, so. <laughs> Our slogan is, teach a brother. Karen gives the spiel, answers questions. I hand out information on the Southern Education Program, then the sponsor takes us out to dinner. It's fun. Glad I don't have to do the speech. February 11th, 1971, Princeton, New Jersey. Karen made me give the speech. <laughs> she didn't even tell me until right before the program started. I tried to freak out, but she wasn't having it, so I had to get up and do it. Once I started, it was pretty cool. 
I believe in what we're doing. So I talked about how important it was and how much they would get out of it. People seemed pretty responsive and came up to thank us afterward and take our brochures. When we got ready to walk across campus for dinner, the whole group of us were together, but I started talking to this guy from Trenton. He said his name was Zarin Burnett and he was a conscientious objector, leaving the next day for two years of alternative service in a state mental hospital. There was snow and ice on the ground and while we were walking, he offered me his arm. It was nice, old fashioned and kind of courtly. We ended up sitting together and kept talking all through dinner. I really liked him. It almost felt like we were picking up a conversation in progress. He walked with us back to our car and it was really cold and very clear dark sky and lots of stars. I wished him luck, but he didn't seem worried about going, like it was another adventure and he was ready for it. It seemed like a movie scene, little snowflakes swirling around us, a brief moment before returning to the struggle. I felt like I should kiss him, but Karen was standing right there, so I didn't. <laughs> January 1, 1979, goals. One, to lose 10 pounds by June and keep it off. Two, to exercise regularly in the morning and run two miles a week. Three, to get back on a regimen of 10 pages a day. Four, to try and query one magazine a month. Five, to get an agent. Six, to sell two scripts to somebody. <laughs> Seven, to finish a draft of the novel. Eight, to complete five short stories. Nine, to complete 20 new poems. 10, to quit my job. <laughs> 11, to revise cat song. 12, to go to LA on business. 13, to pay all consumer bills. 14, to have my own accounts. 15, to go to New York on business. 16, to have my own place by June. 17, to be very bold. May 27, 1981. Don Bryan from the Just Us Theater Company just called me and said, we're considering our next season and we want to know if you have a play we could look at. I told him about Puppet Play and he was excited about it. He invited me to participate in their support group which raises money and I made it very clear that I'm not really interested in raising money. I want to be involved on the artistic side. Fine, he says, why not come and have drinks with us on Friday at the country place? I say, cool, I will. I'm so excited. It is happening at last. August 25th, 1981. Marched into her office. Yes, I did. And I said, I can't stand it. I got to go. I'll stay till the end of September. But sorry, nothing personal, but I got to go. I quit that job. <laughs> Gave notice. She wouldn't hear it. You can't. She said, we'll lose the account if you do. But I didn't cry. I can't be a straight person. I said, I can't do it. And I left the meeting split immediately, came home, took a shower, changed clothes, went to an interview for another job that won't drive me crazy, and <laughs> crossed my fingers. I hope they will hire me, but even if they don't, I feel so good. I feel better. I feel freer. I sat in there and looked at my boss, and I said to myself, you don't have to do this. Be here. Take this. You can split. And I did. <laughs> June 20th, 1982, 10 p.m. A few words on feminism and a true confession, not necessarily in that order, for my friends at Just Us Theater Company. The fact is this, I want to work with y'all. In order for us to do that as successfully as we can, I think it might be helpful for me to say the following few words on feminism. The reason I think this is based on the following two exchanges. The players will remain anonymous, but should be easily recognizable. <laughs> Routine question. Did you put the posters in the feminist bookstore? Surprising answer. Say what? I'm not going in there. Forget it. <laughs> and then, surprising statement. I actually don't think it's a feminist play at all. I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if it's a feminist play, then it would have to be about hating men, right? <laughs> Truthful answer. Well, uh, not necessarily. <laughs> and one bonus surprising statement. Don't take this wrong, but I think it would be better if you don't say you're a feminist. Here's the thing, I am a feminist. I am willing to figure out a way to say that that doesn't frighten off our audience. I am anxious to figure out a way to say that that doesn't frighten off our audience. I am even willing to discuss not admitting to it, but I want y'all to know that is gonna take some discussion before it can be settled. But in exchange, I want you to think about the following. Feminism doesn't have anything to do with hating men. Feminism has to do with understanding power and oppression and control. Feminism has to do with equality, not sameness. 
Feminism doesn't mean unfeminine or hateful or sharp or hard-edged or bitch voice, killer eyes, fists instead of open hands. Feminism is about freedom. Feminism is about choices. Feminism is about an end to self-hate and games and pressure and control and roles where you men get to be strong all the time and we women get to be weak and helpless and nobody gets to have as much fun as we could have. Mm -hmm. I don't care if either of you ever go to the feminist bookstore, but I don't want to feel like I asked you about venturing into a leper colony if I say, <laughs> did you take a poster over to Karis? I don't care if we find a new word so that nobody ever knows what I call myself or my writing as long as we all know what is what and who is who and all of that. And I really don't care if some people think my work is anti-black men or cynical and mean and cold and nasty and too personal and all about a certain nameless someone and isn't it terrible how she puts her own business in the street? <laughs> I don't care about any of that if you know that my work is really about trying to figure out why people can't love each other and what happens when they don't and hopefully even a look at what happens when they do. I don't think any of this touches on what I'm really trying to say. In order to make it clear, I want to start quoting Billie Holiday songs or talking about Georgia O'Keeffe and Alfred Stieglitz and that book of photographs he took of her where she's standing on the radiator naked with that curtain in front of her or how a man who dated my mother once turned to her in horror in the middle of a Saturday afternoon movie and said, you're not one of those women's libbers, are you? And she said she was. <laughs> It's seeing a hard day's night and wanting to be a beetle that makes me feel I have to explain any of this. It's listening to Gershwin in the park that makes me want to get it right. Listen, I won't tread on the macho that I find all around me if you all will consider the thought that I am a self-confessed feminist and I'm not so bad. So how can you believe what they say about any of it? Don't old people say believe only half of what you see, some and none of what you hear? Loving kisses, Pearl. January 17, 1988. Collaboration is like slow dancing, except not as much fun. Because eventually you have to do it in front of people. While you can slow dance in your living room forever and ever and never have to show nobody nothing. <laughs> Things Aaron and I know we have in common. Race, politics, music. Things we struggle on that fuel our work. Sexism and new definitions of love. How do you do it without replicating that old master slave shit? It changes everything when you go on a trip with a man you love while you're working on an Amazon oath to help women free themselves from sexist oppression. In order to make it work, you have to do a couple of things. One, teach him and work with him. Tell him the truth. Two, work to talk always in the context of working together to identify the outrage and survive, share the anger. Three, reinforce progress without pandering. Four, Push the analysis so it isn't just personal, but a total struggle we can engage in against the common enemy of sexism. Five, make him understand that this is not a woman's struggle. This is a right and wrong struggle. We already share a common struggle against racism. We are prepared to offer critical analysis and rigorous self-criticism. But there is still the question to be answered. Can you be a free woman and love and or collaborate with a man? We trade information and ideas through the music. We both know that one of the reasons why Try It Baby is one of the most beautiful songs ever recorded is that Marvin Gaye was lucky enough to get the Temptations to sing back up. I actually believe that an incomplete knowledge of the discography of the Temptations from Dream Come True through the death of Paul Williams makes it almost impossible to understand black American men between the ages of 30 and 50. So deeply has the music shaped their ideas about love and sex and life and death and what it means to be a black man in America. Shaped mine too. I remember hearing Dream Come True and thinking, I want somebody to love me just like that. May 16, 1988. Zarin calls from a public phone with traffic noise in the background and says, come down, it's a beautiful night. The stars are out, come down and see. I'm finishing a poem and I tell him so, but I tell him it's a great idea and try me again another time. I can hear the sex in his voice. But the stars are out, he says, and laughs. How do you know the stars will be out another time? I laugh too. How can I resist? Sometimes it's more fun to be a poem than to write one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's fun to read that in Karis because when I talked to the two guys who I loved so much that I was working with at Just Us, when I asked them if they had put the posters for my play, which was actually a very feminist play in the, in the feminist bookstore, they literally fell back in horror. <laughs> like, I'm not going in there. I said, what do you think is going to happen to you <laughs> if you go in there? I mean, we're not really at the stage where we can like kidnap men and kill them when they come into the bookstore. <laughs> that's, even if we're really, really pissed off, that's not what we do. But it's, I had to really kind of work with them on understanding what feminism was and I, I was pleased and proud of it because they never would have had those discussions if they hadn't been working with me on something altogether different than what they thought we were going to be working on. Mm -hmm. um, so it's wonderful to, to have had that experience so long ago and then all these years later to actually be able to read that um, here in Karis. So I'd be happy to take any questions you have or comments or anything. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. People. I love people. I am endlessly fascinated by how we do what we do um, and why we do what we do. You know, how do we decide how we're going to behave towards each other? I love to listen to people. I was a child who used to really eavesdrop on people. You know, I would ride the Joy Road bus in my neighborhood in Detroit growing up, and I had a little notebook, and I was like 10 years old, 8 years old and riding with my sister, and I would write down conversations that people were having on the bus. Men don't tend to talk much on the bus. Women talk a lot on the bus. And what were they talking about in Detroit on the bus going home from work? Men. They were talking about men. I mean, not mostly like, oh, I love him, he's so good, but he is such a dog, let me talk about him. And I'm, you know, 10 years old writing all this down, and I often wonder what my mother would have thought if she had found these little notebooks and said, you are never riding the bus again. But it was, uh, my sister sister was always very frightened that somebody would see me writing down what they were saying, but nobody pays attention to a little 10-year-old girl writing down anything on the bus. So I did it for years um, because I was fascinated with how people express themselves, what they say, which is probably why I write plays, because I'd, I really, I love to hear how people say what they say <laughs> and see how close I can get to replicating that in a character. I was on the bus one time and this lady got on and she had obviously, she was very eccentric and she had on like kind of an eccentric weird little outfit and a lot of makeup and she was about 70 years old maybe which seemed really old to me then seems like a spring chicken to me now <laughs> um, but she got on the bus and she sat right behind the driver and she was trying to keep up a conversation with the driver who was so not interested in that and she said you know any man who will treat a woman like that is lower than a low down egg sucking dog <laughs> I was <laughs> So it's like, I'm fascinated by people, you know, I'm, she wasn't talking to me, but I wanted to sidle up next to her and said, tell me everything, tell me everything. So it's, it's really, you know, sometimes when people say they have writer's block, they can't figure out what to write about. And it's like, I don't understand that because my, my problem is the opposite one, which is I want to, you know, I don't want to sleep. I want to write all the time. And everybody, you know, it's like, this is a room full of novels. Everything that y'all did this past week. You know, it's like worth writing about. All of these lives in here are just vibrating because all of y'all have done whatever you did all week. Mm -hmm. And your job is to do whatever you do. And my job is to write about our lives so that it's people, it's people um, that always make me, you know, want to write the next story and the next one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you transitioned out of politics mm -hmm. into an artist. Mm -hmm. um, could you just speak for a moment about about the civil rights movement, yeah. Um, and I didn't necessarily segue out of politics altogether. I had, um, I went to work at City Hall. I worked in Maynard Jackson's campaign when he first ran for mayor, which was a wonderful time in Atlanta because we all knew that was a big transition from the past to the future. And he was a wonderful, progressive person, extremely charismatic. Um, and he was like all the things that I would have wanted a candidate to be. I had worked in political campaigns all my life. My father used to run for office all the time. He never won. So that most of the candidates I was working for were very radical, like my dad. So they had great campaigns, but they never were elected. Maynard was the first candidate I ever worked for who actually got elected to office, which was great. And so he asked me to come and work as press secretary at City Hall, which seemed really exciting and wonderful, but a campaign is very different than the actual day-to-day -day bureaucratic work you have to do to make it work. So I lasted two and a half years in City Hall, and then I ran screaming out of City Hall. Um, so that I'd, I kind of removed myself from being a worker who spent 
all that time working in City Hall. But I still am very involved in, you know, in trying to get people to vote and, and all of that. Um, I grew up in a, in, on the west side of Detroit in a very black nationalist household. My um, father was very active in the movement. My whole family was. But my father was a minister, very vocal um, minister. And the, everybody who was doing anything progressive in the civil rights movement came through our church. Um, very, very radical people. My father was closer in ideology to Malcolm X than he was to Martin Luther King. My dad was not nonviolent. Um, but we were also in Detroit, Michigan, not Jackson, Mississippi. So that's the options are very different in terms of what you do. Um, but I was, I was kind of raised in a house where being involved in, in the movement was just what was expected of you. Whatever else you were going to do was fine, but you were going to be involved in the movement. And the work that you chose was to be grounded in trying to help your people move forward. So that I've always had that, that group identification feeling. Um, when I became a feminist, I just added another understanding of what other group I belong to. And that was a, um, a transition because I used to, having been raised in a household that talked all the time about race but never about gender, I used to kind of think I could separate the two so I would be like, okay, my primary, I used to say this, my primary state of emergency is race, my secondary state of emergency is gender. And one day I heard myself say it and I said, that really doesn't make a lot of sense <laughs> because I'm black every day, I'm female every day, so I can't say Monday, Wednesday, Friday I'm going to do black, yeah. Thursday, Friday, Saturday I'm going to do this and then I'm going to take Sunday off. So that I really began to understand how important it is for whoever we are, for all those pieces to be what we bring forward, all those struggles to be what we do. Um, so that I was, I continued to be involved in freedom struggle based on race, but I also became very much involved in gender struggle and feminism, and Karis was a big part of giving me the grounding that I needed to, to move forward with that. So I'm still um, very much um, an advocate of people working together in groups to do stuff. You know, when I hear people um, who are so cynical, it's like it doesn't matter who's the president, it doesn't matter who's the governor, and I say no. You know, no, if you didn't have health insurance and you lived in Georgia and saw that our governor can keep you from getting it just by acting a fool, you would know how important it is to vote. You would know how important it is. So I'm still very involved in that level of, um, of politics because I think that's what, as citizens in a democracy, that's what we have to work with. We can always vote people in and we can vote people out. And the only time it goes askew is when all the progressive people stay home and all the crazy people go to the polls. Then it becomes odd. So I think we have all the tools that we need, and I'm very much involved in trying to make people see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you. I initially read the uh, 83818 mm -hmm. and I immediately purchased the book. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you for Mm -hmm. it made it <coughs> mm -hmm. Oh, great. So Thank I really appreciate you. That. Um, I, and I guess my question to you is, when do we get part two? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever do it again. Um, I know that I'm, I'm probably going to write some more nonfiction. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in speaking in my own voice for a while. I've been writing novels and plays. Um, but I don't know if, um, if I want to go through that process again. Um, the challenge of actually using your real journals that you never meant for anyone else to see, there are several challenges. One is, am I going to clean myself up? So that when I present myself to y'all, I am so perfect. I know everything. I never say anything stupid. I never have affairs with people I shouldn't be having affairs with. I never smoke anything I'm not supposed to smoke. I never do any of those things. But if you do that, it defeats the whole purpose. Um, because for me, part of what, um, what I'm aware of now at this age is that a lot of women in my generation, when we talk to younger women, we clean ourselves up so much that sometimes I'll listen to my friends and say, who are you? <laughs> I know you. I know that's not how you lived. And if you don't tell it, the lessons are lost. Because, you know, if somebody comes to you and confesses the messiness of their 22-year-old life and you try to act like you weren't messy at 22, they don't understand that everybody's messy at 22 and 32 and 42 and 52. <laughs> Life is messy, you know, it's very messy. And I think when you get to the point where you realize that, wow, there's not a moment when you can just say, great, now I'm 50, everything is going to be cool, I understand everything. But that's not true. When you realize that it's never true, 
Because when you understand one thing, there's always another question. There's another part of you that you're trying to bring into line with what the truth is as you know it. So that the whole idea of cleaning up our lives, I think just defeats the whole purpose of it. So there's that. Are, are you prepared to share your self warts and all with people? So I was at the place where I was like, yeah, I am. <laughs> you know, if they love me, fine. If they don't, I get it. I understand. Not a problem. Um, the other thing is that these are real people that I'm writing about who just happen to um, be included in a book because their lives intersected with mine. But they may not have been, the people who are in all these journal pages, may not have come to the same point in their lives that I am in mine, where it's like, I don't care what people know about me as long as it's the truth. They can put anything anywhere and I will not deny it because I know that all of it led me to being here free. Yeah. And so any messiness that I had, it got me to be a free woman. And I wouldn't change a thing. Because if you change one thing, it's like pulling something on a sweater. You know, next thing you look up, the sweater's gone. So that I, I don't want to do that. But I also was very conscious of not um, revealing more than my friends wanted to, to have revealed. To be sure that people um, did not feel like I had betrayed their confidence simply because they knew me at a certain point in my life. Um, I have a very good friend, Kay Hagen, who was very involved in Karis for many years, um, lives in Washington now, but um, her wife is um, like a big shot at Homeland Security, working for the federal government. So when I was writing this book, I'm thinking, you know, the, the right-wing Republicans who were so after President Obama are looking for anything in his administration. So I didn't want them to be able to trace that my friend Kay is married to someone in Homeland Security and, you know, she's smoking dope and going to rock concerts. You know, so it's like, okay, I, so I asked her, I said, okay, I will change your name if there's going to be any kind of problem for you because I'm talking about our lives when we were very young women. And I sent her the manuscript to read it. So she read the manuscript and she said, oh no, I have to be my real name, <laughs> you know, because this was like my life too, my life too. So the only people I was really um, concerned about, um, other than Kay because of the political um, implications, I, I was married once before, so I, I wanted to reassure my first husband that I had not and would never say anything that, um, you know, that was a problem for him. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very conscious of that. Um, and I was very conscious of my daughter, who was young when this um, book was taking place. But just to tell her, you know, this doesn't say anything about you. You know, you're four years old. You're cool. Don't worry. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. But I think that that's the, the difficulty of writing not just about yourself, but about other people, is that you have to be sensitive to them. I think that's only fair. Um, the people, um, the gentlemen in here who should not have been fooling around with me, but who were, um, I, I mentioned to, um, you know, to one of them that I was writing a book about this time period and said, I won't use your name and I won't say anything that, you know, that would identify you specifically. Um, but you will know, you know, that it's you. So I want you to know that so you can be ready for it. And, you know, he was like, okay, not a problem. It's fine. Um, and I think that most of the time people who, um, who know me would trust me that I wasn't trying to, I don't have any access to grind. I'm not mad at anybody. Um, but I think you have to be. Oh, I'm still, I'm mad at Miles. I'm still mad at Miles, but he's dead now. So I'm hoping his spirit is gonna peace out and come back and be fabulous. But, um, but it's that where you wanna honor the people that you know and love and not expose them to, to critique because you decided to tell all. So I don't know if I wanna, um, if I wanna do that again, but you know, it's tempting because I've still got boxes and boxes and boxes um, of things. And my, my daughter who was so like, don't do it, don't do it when I first said it, I realized that it wasn't that um, she didn't want me to do a book like this. My daughter is very protective of me, where I can get a bad review and I really don't care. If I get like 50 great reviews and one bad one, my daughter wants to hunt down the person that wrote the bad <laughs> review and tell them all about their sorry sales. And I'm like, you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. So I think that she was afraid that I was opening myself up to lots of criticism from people who didn't appreciate what I had to say. And I'd, I hadn't really thought about it because um, I don't tend to react to what people say in that way. Um, and I've been completely gratified by the response that I've gotten literally coast to coast is that people say, you know, the kind of thing that you said that they appreciated and that it made them remember what they were doing at that time. And then younger women, it has really been helpful 
in helping them have conversation with their mothers. Because even if their mother won't tell them the truth, they know I'm the same age as their mother. So that it kind of gives them a safe space to talk about what the mother's life was really like and all that. So it's, um, it's been, and my daughter's fine with it now. You know, it's like she's, she's happy with it. It's all fine. But she still said her kids are a little young to be reading it. <laughs> so you don't know this, need to know that about their grandmother. But I would love to have found journals of my grandmother. You know, I mean, I found that journal once of my mother's and I put it back so carefully because I wanted to go back and read the rest. And so I waited till she was gone again I snuck back to where I had put it back and it was gone so obviously I did not put it back exactly the way it was because I never found another journal of my mother's ever and my grandmother's I don't I don't know if they even kept journals but um, I think you know if my granddaughters and my grandson I have I have one I'm gonna have another one soon um, well my daughter's having another one it'd be not me but it's um, uh, if they ever are curious about their grandmother's life I think it you know it'll be amusing to them to say Go ahead, Granny. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Can you pronounce your daughter's name? Dagnan. 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 Yeah. Dagnan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How you doing? Hi. Good. 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 I'm so glad you're thank you for this book. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is a perfect segue to the thing that I wanted to ask you about. It. Um, I thought you had the coolest mother. Yeah, <laughs> she was. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, at what point, you know, or maybe there wasn't a point where there was a transition, but when you went from a kind of mother-daughter relationship to a woman-to-woman -woman relationship, mm -hmm. because it seems like she really related to you as a woman. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until I was very grown. I mean, I had, I had had my daughter, I was living here, and I was divorced from my first husband. Um, and my mother had gotten sick, she had cancer, my mother died of cancer. Um, but it was, like, I was very grown, and it was actually feminism that allowed us a space to talk as women because she was trying to discover feminism but um, she lived in the in the country they lived in Idlewild Michigan a tiny little town and my stepfather was really not feeling all of this new feminist stuff and there was nobody in this tiny little town that was feeling it so that we started writing letters back and forth about it and I would send her books and all of that and it really I think gave her a vocabulary to talk to me about her life and it gave me a space to ask her about her life. And we really, I think, used that feminist awakening for both of us to have a space to talk. And it was, it was absolutely wonderful. I'm so grateful that we had that time um, because it's, you know, it's, you don't always get to make that transition with your mother to when you're, you know, you're always the baby girl. You're always the, you know, you never can really talk about that. Um, and we did have that, have that chance to really talk to each other like grown women. And I have several, I thought um, a long time about whether or not I should put her letters um, to me in the book because my mother was such a private person and the, the fact that she was talking to me about being sick and all of that, I, you know, I had to weigh whether or not how she would feel about that. And then I finally came to that I thought she would really appreciate the fact of me sharing her journey in the same time I was sharing mine. So I, um, you know, so I decided to in include the letters. Um, the other thing is that one of those letters she says, you know, I always loved you because you were my little baby and you know you always love your little baby, um, but I never really thought about you as a grown woman that I could talk to. And now I realize that I don't just love you, but I really like you. And it was like, I mean, you can't ask for more than that from your mother. So that was really a, a wonderful a moment for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you still journal? And um, I have sort of a second part of the question. When you journal, are you journaling like planning ahead or after the fact of things happening? Um, yes, I still keep journals. Um, and I'm doing everything. I mean, I'm planning ahead. I'm looking back on what I did. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do next. I'm whining a lot, you know, about everything. I don't feel like going to the grocery store. I'm mad about this, mad about that. Um, and then trying to actually talk about what I saw, um, what I heard, you know, like writing those things on the bus. Um, so that I'd, I'd never thought about publishing journals, so that I never restricted myself in any way. I talk about everything. Um, and I still do it. I think it's, it's almost a meditation sort of, because you kind of check in with yourself every day just to see what you're thinking, um, whether or not you're consistent. Um, one of the things that made me realize how useful um, journals can be 
is it was New Year's Eve. I was married to my first husband and I was at home by myself with my daughter and he was out politicking. He was a politician at that time. Um, and I was home by myself on New Year's Eve listening to, and I want to say it was Smokey Robinson probably, and weeping, you know, so sad, my life is so terrible, everything is awful. And in the middle of this kind of, you know, indulgent, self-indulgent weep, I said to myself, you know what, this feels really familiar to me. So I went to look at the New Year's Eve before that. It was exactly, I mean, it could have been a carbon copy of what it was. I said, wow, that's not good. Let me see about the year before. Three years in a row, same thing. I was at home by myself weeping about how my life was terrible and what was I going to do and all that stuff. And I thought to myself, I know one thing, whatever I'm doing next year, New Year's Eve, I'm not going to be at home crying by myself, listening to old Motown records. I'm not doing it. But it was, I don't think I would have understood um, so clearly so um, much that I needed to, this was the point when I was ready to make a change. If I hadn't been able to go back and see that for three years running, I had been saying the same thing. And it's like, okay, now it's time to, to actually do something. Um, so that it's, it's useful, I think, to keep journals, to, to write them and then to keep them so that you can check back in, you know, and see if you're making progress or if you're stuck, you know, if you're stuck. So I, I do, I think I'll, I'll probably always keep them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I kept since I was 25, I mm -hmm. wrote diaries when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started at 25, and um, my family's always so surprised when I um, make a decision because I want choices, and mm -hmm. I don't want someone telling me what those choices should be. Mm -hmm. And I can be very definite, and they're just so, you know, um, amazed because they well, well, maybe dad or, you know, whatever. And, um, That's what journals are really good for that because you're, you have a chance to work out all of that kind of back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. So then when you say what you have to say, you sound like you were just so cool because you know everything, <laughs> right? I like it for that. I do. I like it for that. Yes, ma'am. Um, How you doing? How you doing? Good. I'm good. Um, when you were observing people, you know, as you've been watching people and writing plays, what have you noticed that makes people mean? Makes them mean? Mm -hmm. There's so many things, I think, <laughs> that make people mean. I think the main thing is they don't have what they want. And most of the time what they want is somebody to look at them and say, you are just so amazing and fascinating and beautiful. I love you. Mm -hmm. And when they don't get it and they keep looking for it, they keep looking for it, mm -hmm. then I think that makes people mean. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so, many, there's so many ways that people can be mean <laughs> to each other. Um, but I think at the heart of it, and this sounds so naive, I hate to even say it, but I think at the heart of most people's meanness is that they're not being loved by anybody. Mm -hmm. So that then they don't get that back at all and they might really want it they might not know how to send that out into the world either but i think there's a, a twisting of um what love can be most of the time that makes people that makes people mean um most of what i would hear listening to people was not meanness but confusion and disappointment you know i invested this hope in him this hope i hear you baby i hear you i hear you um and now you know i'm not i'm not getting back what i want so that that would be a lot um, my mother um, married brothers in the same family, not at the same time, of course. Um, but we were riding the bus one day, and I heard these two women um, talking about my mother. Now, I was fascinated by that because she had married my uncle at that point, and it was, you know, like I didn't realize that it hadn't occurred to me that my family's personal business was so public and scandalous that somebody <laughs> be talking about my mom on the bus. So this woman was just talking about my mother and how this was so terrible and all that stuff. Now I'm writing in my little notebook, you know, wow, this is really deep. <laughs> my sister was livid, so she pulled the bell. You know, you used to have to pull the bell on the bus. And we got off like two miles ahead of where we were supposed to get because she was really angry at these women. So we had to walk home the two miles. And I was like, of course I was mad about the walk, but I was also mad because I wanted to hear what else they had to say about my mother, you know, but it's, uh, it was funny to me because my, my family never presented that as such a scandalous thing and there weren't any big screaming fights about it, so it didn't seem scandalous to me. And when I heard that, I was like, wow, they, they really think my mother is like a dynasty character or something. You know? so it's, but it's, um, you know, it's that, I think, a lack of love that makes people so mean. I love that question. That's a, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come to you. Go ahead, talk loud for me. Mm -hmm. You know, one of your grandkids, your daughter, you read that. I mean, when did you reach that, or, or did you always have that even when you were writing? You know, I mean, because 
about sharing them? Right. Well, I, I never really thought about sharing them in a public way. And of course, at that point, I didn't have any grandchildren, so I wasn't thinking about mm -hmm. them. But when my daughter was 15, I just, I'm, you know, there's different kinds of people. There's the kind of person that if they're staying at your house, they're going to look through all your stuff. They're going to look through the medicine cabinet. They're going to look at your desk, all of that. And then there's people who would never do it, no matter how often you leave them alone in your house. I tend to be in that first group that's going to look through your stuff. So I wanted my daughter to, to have permission so she wouldn't have to be sneaking and think maybe, you know, my mother will be so freaked out if she knows I read it. Um, so I told her she could read my diaries, and she had, like, no interest at all. She was like, no, thank you. That's enough. That's too much information. I don't need to know. Um, so that there never was a, a moment when she took me up on it. And my diaries are all over the house. I mean, like this, you know, so she could have done it. Um, the only other person I ever invited to do that um, was my husband, my, my husband now, Zarin, who was the guy I'm talking about in the book that, that eventually we got married. Um, but we had started living together and I was going to be on the road for three weeks and he was going to be at the house. And these diaries are all over and I thought to myself, if it was me and he was gone for three weeks, I would put him on the plane and I would run home <laughs> so I could see what he had to say. Of course, first I wanted to know what he had to say about me, but then just generally what he had to say about anything. So I said to him, I'm going to be gone for three weeks, you know, and I don't want you to feel like you have to sneak and read any of these. So you have my permission. You can read any of these diaries. You can read all of these diaries. It's, it's fine. I love you. I think you love me. So you might as well know everything about me. You can read them all. Um, but the only rule is you can't ask me questions about them when I get back. You can't say, what was that on page 62 of 1986? Because that was going to be a different thing that I wasn't prepared to do. But I said, you can read them all. So he said, no, okay, thank you for the permission. So I was gone for three weeks. I came back. He didn't say anything about any diaries or anything. So I'm the one who said, don't ask me any questions. But I'm saying, wow, I can't stand it. <laughs> did he read them? Did he read them? So I, I finally asked him, I said, did you, did you read any of the diaries? And he said, yes. I said, well, you know, how many of them did you read? He said, I read all of them. So it's like, I'm the one who said he could do it. But when he said he had read all of them, you know, it's like I felt like I was naked in front of somebody. Like, oh, my God. But he didn't ask me anything because I had told him not to. So finally I had to say, okay, well, you know, <laughs> what'd you think? <laughs> My rule, right? What did you think? And he said, well, I'll tell you what I thought. I thought when I got through that men don't know a damn thing about women. They think they do, but they don't. He said, we have no idea what y'all are thinking, how you think it, none of that. And I think it was really helpful to him because he realized how much Many of us do this, which is we talk to somebody we love right here, and the truth of what we're thinking is right here, and they never know it. But it's hard to sustain that level of artifice, so eventually the real you is going to come bursting forth. And then the person is like, oh my God, who is this angry woman, or who is this crazy person, or whatever, because you've constructed an alternate persona for them. So that the fact that he was able to see a lot of that in these diaries, in these journals, um, I think really um, humbled him in a way because he understood the pressure that women are often under to try to figure out what does the man that you love want to hear, what does the person that you love want to hear, and how can I make them believe that's what I want to. Um, so I thought that was, a, that was a wonderful response because it allowed us to have a space to talk where he had admitted that he wanted to know more about, um, about what I really thought about things, not something else that I was thinking about things. Um, he was also um, a person who made it really, helped me make a very important discovery, which is anybody can understand feminism if they want to. Mm -hmm. You know, but you have to want to. It's like a different idea about things. And I was in the, between the um, marriages that I had, I had discovered feminism, discovered Karis. So I used to give people a book list who asked me out on dates. You know, if I went on one date and it was like, it was good. And I would say, okay, this is nice. We're having a good time. But if you're really going to be with me, you need to read these <laughs> books. And people, you know, they'd look at me like, you're kidding, right? And I would be like, and it was like, I wish I had a copy of the list. I can't remember. Um, um, I know that two of them were Marion Zimmer Bradley books um, about the Amazons. Those, those were two on there, but I don't I think Woman Hating, Andrea Dworkin's book was on there. But, you know, nobody else would read the books. They would try to fake it and tell me they had read the books. And then, of course, they hadn't really read the books. And I gave the list to my husband, who wasn't my husband then, um, and he read all of them. 
So it was like, okay, check that off. That's really good. <laughs> but, you know, I asked him, I said, I think that's so great that you actually did it. You know, what made you, what made you do that? And he said, well, it was important to you. That was the first thing. And the second thing was I realized that I really didn't know anything about feminism. And I hate to not know that there's something I could know and I haven't made the effort to do it. So I really wanted to know, which I thought was funny. That was kind of a, an interesting male perspective, like, what? She knows something I don't know. <laughs> I, need to, I need to catch up. But that was, um, that was like a part of the, the idea that I wasn't trying to hide anything. You know, I wasn't trying to, to reassure people that it was okay. I wasn't trying to do the missionary work where you explain everything. It's like, you know, men run the world. So in spite of what Beyonce says, you know. <laughs> um, so it's like, okay, you can figure out how to send people to the moon. You can figure out how to build skyscrapers. You can figure out how to understand feminism. Read the books, you know, read the books. Don't ask me to explain, read the books. And he was the only person that I knew, the only man that I knew who ever did that, which was a really wonderful um, point in us being able to talk about things in an honest way. Mm -hmm. Did you have something? Yeah. Oh, how are you? Oh, my goodness. Mwah. How are you? Oh, Good to wonderful. see you. When I saw the title of this book, My Spirit Shell, <laughs> I immediately got tears in my eyes um, because it made me think of my mother, the woman behind my mother. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's what this book does. Mm -hmm. It's like, what will my mom tell me? You know? Yeah. I'm a daughter, and mm -hmm. I have a daughter. Mm -hmm. You know? And so. You know, it just really brought up a lot of emotions, mm -hmm. spiritually and all of that, because my mother, she has recently been married 43 years to my dad, mm -hmm. but her first child out of five of us was from a married man. Mm -hmm. And that has been the running thing from mm -hmm. my whole family. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you because it allowed me as a daughter to, like, you know, have a woman-to-woman -woman moment with my mother. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so know? glad. And that has been hard for my other sisters, mm -hmm. and I want to find the bravery in like, yeah. talking about her story at 20 years old, like, with her tears yeah. and things like that. Yeah. You know? So just wanted to say thank you for it. I see you. Mm. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a wonderful writer, this woman. Wonderful oh, writer. You. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. How has um, the South, specifically Atlanta, shaped you as a writer and as a woman? Um, I moved to Atlanta in 1969, and I was 20 years old. I had never lived by myself. I went from my mother and father's house to the dormitories at, at mm -hmm. Howard University, and then I'd, I came here and got married. Um, so that I had never really been responsible for myself. I couldn't even drive when I came here. I'm probably the only person from Detroit who never knew how to drive. Um, so you know what I'm talking about. Everybody in Detroit is cars, cars, cars. Um, so that I really feel in a real way that I grew up here. I became a woman here um, because I was responsible for myself, for my own decisions. Um, I got married soon after I came here, and I realized that I was doing things that were totally not satisfying to me um, because I was doing the same things I had seen my mother do and seen my grandmothers do and they didn't seem too pleased with it either you know especially my mother but when I got married I just those were the habits I knew so those were the things um, that I was doing and the fact that I went from having no information about feminism to having information about it really changed the trajectory of my life as a as a woman and I got that here in Atlanta um, so all the things about just having to grow up and take care of yourself and be responsible for yourself really happened for me here um, the other thing about like Atlanta as a place specific place I grew up in such a movement family that when I came here in 1969 there were so many movement people here that it instantly felt like home to me um, my first job was at the Martin Luther King, it was called the Martin Luther King Library Documentation Project at that time, and Dr. King had been dead for just a year. And Mrs. King was already trying to make sure that his work stayed alive and, and stayed present in our minds so that what
what we were doing was going all over the South, collecting information from civil rights workers. You know, can we have that box in your attic? Can we have that trunk in your basement full of stuff? Um, so that it could be processed and people could use it. So that I also, um, by being here and working in that way, got to talk to a lot of movement people about what they had done. And being an activist in Detroit, Michigan is very different than Sunflower County, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to SNCC people who were not that much older than I was, who had done, I mean, absolutely risked their lives and some of them didn't survive it. Um, so that it was wonderful for me to, to find when I got here a movement family that I was grounded in. Um, a lot of the people that I met here knew my dad, so that they, you know, it's kind of like, you know, this is, oh, you're Reverend Clegg's little girl, you know, and I was 20, but they, I was Reverend Clegg's little girl. <laughs> so that they were very protective of me and kind of took me into that movement circle. So that I think that was something that really um, gave me a, a more direct appreciation for what the civil rights movement meant um, in the South as opposed to the activist things that we did in the North. It gave me a real understanding and appreciation of that. And then just, um, Atlanta's a good size, it's bigger now, but it was when I got here, it was like the perfect size for me. You know, it was big enough so that it wasn't a tiny little town, but it wasn't New York where you're just freaked out, how do I find my way around? It was a good place for me um, in that way um, as well, because I instantly found a movement community and an artist community. So that it's, it's really been a good place. And sometimes I get mad at Atlanta. You know, it's like so conservative, are y'all ever gonna change and all that kind of stuff. But that's true, I think, anywhere. Um, that you go, and I'm I'm so grounded here um, because I've been here for a long time, and I I really love the place with all its contradictions and crazy. Um, so I I can't imagine now moving somewhere else, you know. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come right back. I know, uh, a little bit of a change. Could you name three or four issues, domestic issues in this country that concern you, and maybe give us a little hope? Oh, God. Um, I'm very concerned about, um, about the environment. I just drove through the Southwest, and the drought is real. The, I mean, the land looks horrible. It's just parched. We were driving through Amarillo, Texas, and we had to stop because the rain, there was like a big rainstorm. So I'm trying to get to LA, so I'm thinking, you know, as we all do about our own things. And I'm thinking, wow, this rain is terrible. It's been raining for two days. I'm trying to get to California. And the people in Amarillo hadn't had any rain for four years. So they were out in the street with their clothes on, just letting the rain hit them. So it's one of those moments where you say, wow, I'm worrying about a book tour, and they're trying to stay alive here. So I'm very concerned about the environment and our lack of um, stewardship of the planet. I'm concerned about that. Um, I'm very concerned about immigration, um, about how inhumane we are to people who want to come here. Um, and there's all the stuff in the news now about the children and all of that. And that's just the very tip of the iceberg about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, the fact that there is actually a wall that people built to try to keep other people out is just horrifying to me. So I'm concerned about immigration. Um, I am hopeful about um, the fact that the thing that depresses me so much, which is John Boehner and the Tea Party crowd, um, that they got beat in Mississippi in a way that was very smart um, and very strange, you know, because it's like those two guys, neither one is what you would call a progressive guy. Uh, the Tea Party guy was just totally to the right, to the Klan idea right of right wing. Um, the other guy has been in Congress forever, and he's like a traditional old southern Mississippi politician. But he's going to be easier to beat in the general election than the Tea Party guy. So that a lot of folks who are really not Republicans, their primaries are like ours. You can vote in any primary you want, you don't have to declare. So a lot of Democrats voted in this recent election in Mississippi to make sure that the weaker candidate got on the ballot. So that then if there's a, a Democratic candidate with any sense, he can beat this vulnerable Republican. Which meant that the people in Mississippi in that district outthought the right wing people who thought they were gonna put this really, I mean a, a Klan kind of a guy, he had Klan people at his rallies and all of that, um, that they were gonna be able to kind of sweep in because it was Mississippi. So that made me feel very hopeful because we have 
the tool to elect anybody we want. I think there's always more good people, more progressive people than there are bad people. But they tend to stay mad all the time, so they vote in the midterm elections. We come out for the presidential elections, then we go home and do what sane people do. We have babies, we, you know, we open bookstores, we do you know, regular things. But if you're driven by anger and control and hatred, you never go home. You stay there all the time and you do all the stuff that needs to be done. Um, so that I'm very conscious of trying to make people understand that it doesn't help to throw up your hands and be cynical. You have to vote. You have to do it. Um, I'm very concerned about the assault on women's reproductive health. Um, very concerned about that. And it's, you know, the problem with the news that we get is there'll be something that's in the news for a long time and then it goes away and we think it's gone away. And it's really not. So that the, the fact that many young women can't imagine a time when abortion was legal, was illegal in this country. And in my college age lifetime, there were girls at Howard University who actually had illegal abortions and one of them died my freshman year, bled to death because she didn't want to call her mother and say she had had an abortion. So she laid up in her boyfriend's apartment and bled to death. Now that was 1966. So that it doesn't have to always be safe for us to have control of our own bodies. You know, there was a time when people couldn't get birth control. Many young women can't even believe that. But I think all of those attempts to pull back those rights um, are tied to all those other kinds of things that are going on to control people and make them dependent. So those are some of the things that are of great concern to me. The thing that makes me feel optimistic is just that when I'm out talking to people in small groups like this, um, people are very much hopeful about the country. They want the country to continue to move forward. Um, and I think that it can if all of us who actually want it to move forward instead of backward will continue to vote, will continue to talk to each other, will continue to, um, to do the work that needs to be done. And you can see, you know, sometimes when we get so close, it seems like nothing has changed, everything is terrible, we feel cynical and all of that. But I think if you step back just a minute, which is why going to the Center for Civil and Human Rights is so wonderful because you say, no, we've changed a lot. And why did this country change? Because people pushed it. They made it change. They made it change. Um, the whole idea that states are just one after the other allowing gay people to marry is like wonderful and would not have been imaginable 20 years ago. You know, the fact that women do have the right to have legal abortions would not have happened, you know, a while ago. And all of those things happened because we American people agreed that this is the kind of country that we wanted. So that I'm optimistic that if we stay engaged and don't throw up our hands and get cynical and leave poor President Obama out there by himself, yeah. um, then we can do what needs to be done. I have great concern about foreign policy, but there's no reason to start talking about that. Um, but I think the, the main thing that makes me feel hopeful is just that we do have the right to vote. We can vote without feeling like our lives are in danger. And if we do it, we can make anything happen in this country that we want. Because there's always more good people than there are bad people. I do believe that. Is that optimistic? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> How you doing? Great. Good. good to be here. Thank Great you. To hear your voice. And um, I can actually sit here and listen to you all day. And, um, <laughs> so I'm delighted to be here. Um, I had several questions, and I can't remember one. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, what are you working on now? And um, what would you say is uh, your most your strongest legacy? My strongest legacy. Mm -hmm. I don't think about that, because that's kind of like when I'm dead, you know? <laughs> so I haven't resigned myself to that yet, so I don't think about that. I, you know, I hope that my, my work you know, will continue to resonate for people, but I really don't think about that. I hope that the work I'm doing now is, is good. I know it's good for me, so I hope that it, it's a good thing. But I don't, I don't tend to think about legacies and things like that. Um, what was the other thing you asked me? What am I working on now? Okay. Um, I am the uh, playwright in residence at the Alliance Theater. Um, it's a, um, Mellon, a grant from the Mellon Foundation. I'm in residence there for three years. Um, and so I am um, actually doing a lot of work at that theater. Um, one of the things that I have recently started doing, which I had never thought would happen, is working with young people. I never worked with high school students or younger. 
Um, and I did this project, the Collision Project, uh, four years ago, working with 20 high school students. And it was just a wonderful experience for me. Um, it worked against my own cynicism. It really helped me um, not have a very stereotyped idea about, oh, young people throw up my hands and run screaming into the night. It's like, no, they're as different as all of us. They're just young. So that that has been really important to me. And I um, have been doing that project every year. I um, just completed the first draft of a play for kids kids even younger. I have a grandson who's 12 and I've been taking him to the theater, you know, his whole life. But the last time I took him, they were doing um, Charlotte's Web at the Alliance. So I took him, but he was 11. And after the play, he was like, okay, I, I think I've had enough of the pig. I think I'm like a little old for that pig and that spider and all that stuff. So I thought to myself, wow, I really, I don't want him to not have theater from 12 to like 18 when he can start seeing the other stuff, or 16 when he can start seeing the other stuff. So I thought about writing a book for his age group specifically, for, for middle school, which is the challenge for anybody who works with young people. You know, kids are good and high school is good, middle school is really like challenging. Um, but I'd, I um, just finished the first draft of the, um, of the play and um, it participated in a festival at the Kennedy Center just to hear it read and do some work with actors for a week. And it's, um, it'll be in the season at the Alliance, not this season, but next season. And it's called Tell Me My Dream. So that'll be, um, that'll be my play. This next season coming up at the Alliance, um, they're doing a 20th anniversary production of my play, Blues for an Alabama Sky, which is just so amazing to me that it's 20 years old. But Kenny Leon commissioned that play, right, when I was first working with him at the Alliance. And Felicia Rashad came down, and she had just finished doing the Cosby Show, and she was in the play. We went to Howard together, so I kind of was lucky that she was prepared to read the play and then um, come and do it. Um, but we're doing a 20th. Um, anniversary of Blues for an Alabama Sky in May, so I hope you all will, will come um, and take a look, yeah. And then I'm going to figure out what kind of, you know, I'm not going to do the journals, but i got to write something else. I have to write another book, so I'll probably do a, um, like a first person thing, like essays or something like that. Um, I don't have another novel in my head right now. Novels are hard to write. You know, it just, it takes a long time. There's no rehearsal afterward where you get to hang out with other artists. It's like a solitary thing. So I don't see any more um, novels in my immediate um, plan, but, you know, I'm always working on something. Always working on something. Thank you. One question, one more question. How you doing? I'm good. Good, I'm good. Um, I think your work is so important for women, for African Americans, and just for people. And I'm wondering um, if anything is in place where your papers, your writings, your manuscripts, all those things will be housed. Emory. Okay. They're going to be at Emory. Um, yeah, they're going to be at Emory. And I, I graduated from Spelman so that, um, did you hear the question she asked me about um, papers, um, you know, manuscripts and all of that stuff? Um, and I had initially thought about um, placing everything at Spelman, <coughs> but Spelman has an extremely <coughs> limited budget for um, for that kind of archival work. And it really takes a lot of money to store papers in a climate controlled environment and all of that, and to actually prepare them for use by people. And Spelman has Tony K. Bambara's papers, they have Audre Lorde's papers, but they don't have anybody to process them. So if you're a scholar and you wanna see what Tony had to say, you can't get to it because it's in a box. You know, you can't get to it. Um, so that the um, Emory Library is doing quite a bit of collecting of African American American authors and I had thought about Emory but you know I had that I really would like to put them at Spelman but I knew that was the the choice that would not make them accessible and then Alice Walker put her papers at Emory and I'd love Alice Walker so I said well if it's good enough for Alice it's good, it's good enough for me so all of that is there thank you so much thank you thank you thank you